covenant. Um, the, the word covenant is very important for us to understand as I intimated, uh, I, I said uh, it's so important that, uh, and I brought the picture of David coming on the scene after Goliath had challenged the nation for 40 days. David came with a different attitude. David stood on a different pedestal. David brought hope and faith into the whole nation when there was uh, 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 a looming uh, uh, destruction, death, uh, um, lack, failure, defeat. David brought hope. Why? Because he understood covenant. And we decided in these 40 days, we're going to really, really share, meditate, pray. In the next few days, we'll be using some scriptures, powerful scriptures of prayer. Uh, but I thought I would start with the basic and the systematic teaching on this matter of covenant in order for us to uh, uh, really bring that kind of hope to the nation. And we are so grateful that the president today uh, declared a day of prayer. Uh, it's a public holiday. He wanted it real that much that he, for it to bring that level of impact it should be declared a public holiday and he did he declared it a public holiday so that everybody may take this seriously so that it's not just like any other prayer that honors god in history when kings or leaders did that it always honored god you know that jonah was sent to nineveh nineveh was a city of the assyrians the headquarters of the assyrians they were the first uh, 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 terrorists, you know, in their days, they were terrible people. They invented all the uh, tactics of terrorism. So when they attacked you, you'd know you were in problems. Hezekiah was attacked by Seneca and he was in terror because when they got you, they really, really ripped you apart. And so uh, uh, when Jonah was sent, he didn't want to go there because he wanted them dead. So he hid himself so that the 40 days that God had declared would expire and then the, the whole city would uh, uh, be destroyed. So he went, instead, he decided to run away to Tashish, which was a, a fishing resort. He said, let me run to the fishing resort. The 40 days will expire and then the city will be destroyed. So uh, he didn't go there. He ran out, the Bible says he ran away from the presence of the Lord. Very important. So running to the fishing resort, God said, oh, so you are after fish, you'll catch one. So when he was thrown uh, overboard in the ship, as the pastor there has been mentioning, are you just sleeping when everybody else is crying to his God? Uh, we are in problems and you're just sleeping, get off, 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 off your sleep and start crying to God. Now he, he told them the truth. You know what? Don't worry. I mean, don't waste time. I'm not going to even pray. You're having this problem because of me. Throw me overboard because it's me who's causing this problem. And they did. He caught, he caught a very big fish. Of course, catch, caught him and he was uh, swallowed. Three days later, after his repentance and brokenness, the well uh, 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 spews him out on the land. I said, but Lord, the days are already finished. It cannot even work. And now, even if I go, because the days are no longer. God said, no, no, I never started. Actually, uh, I told you 40 more days and the city will be destroyed. I was waiting for you to start. So the 40 days are still intact. So go start preaching now. I hadn't started counting the days. When you start preaching, that's when I will count the days. <laughs> so the, so uh, Jonah went and started preaching, and uh, you, you know what happened? The king had the evil that God had declared, and the king well, at that time was Shalmanesha the uh, fourth. He was known for, uh, at that time, he was not a godly man at all. He was wicked. But when he had, he humbled himself. He directed that nobody should eat just one day. Everybody should fast. That pleased the Lord so much that he forgave the whole city. Uh, of course, the Assyrian Empire, when you go back to their history, another hundred years went on without the Assyrians. That was in 712. And they continued until later on during Nahum's time, 
when they sinned again, 100 years had passed. Nahum went to preach to them. This time they didn't repent and they were destroyed by the Babylonians and the media. So you can see 100 years, just because Shalmaneser the fourth repented, called upon a fast, called the whole nation to prayer and repentance. God honors that kind of uh, 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 um, uh, re response uh, and a gesture before the Lord of re humility and repentance. Similar to Ahab, 22 years of wickedness, was worshiping other gods, was, uh, he had Jezebel as a wife and witch witchcraft was prevalent. They had all these wicked uh, 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 priests. But one day of prayer and fasting, when Elijah had spoken that he would be destroyed and he would be judged, the Bible says Ahab did not uh, eat. He fasted, he went in his garden and walked slowly. God called uh, uh, Elijah and said, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Whatever I had decided to do now, I have postponed. Uh, he will not suffer any of those things. It is his son who will now suffer. So he postponed the judgment that was due that time. And then it came during Ahazia, his son. So you can see when leaders call upon nations in prayer and, and they declare it a national matter. It is something that God does not take lightly. When a leader, a president, a king or so does it, then God considers that and honors it as a national matter of humbling ourselves. Why? Because pride is what most cases causes nations to go into problems. God hates pride. He keeps them afar, but gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves, we receive grace. Today, I'm going to say something a little bit more about grace. I'm going to do a little bit more about that, but I wanted to give it that background that as a nation, we, the believers, should know some of these principles and we should encourage our leaders. So when we approach our leaders and guide them accordingly, there are people who just uh, are more and just speak the way they speak, you really feel bad. Some are pastors. They don't even understand some of these principles, but they're key in the Bible. We see God's dealings with nations. These are key principles. God honors leaders when they humble them. So they don't know very much. They may not know the way you know. They may not pray the way you pray. They may not even shout and what you, but for God, if a leader calls a whole nation and say today, all of us are going to go to God. Very, very important before God. That is something that God really on us, not only in the Bible, even in history. The nation of America, one of its secrets and what has made it very, very great a nation now at the moment, is that in their first 200 years, from about 1600 to about 1800, a total of 1,400 days of prayer and fasting were called by various presidents. In their 200 years, 1,400 times their presidents and leaders declared national days of prayer and fasting. The same with Britain. Uh, one of the highlights of their uh, times of seeking and calling upon God was when the, Sp the Spanish attacked them in 1588, something around that. The Spanish Armada was very, very big. Spain was so big at that time, so powerful. It was stronger than Britain. Britain was just an island. And Spain wanted it reclaimed. Uh, and and uh, you know, uh, Britain then had, had broken off, had declared independence from the Pope. And the, uh, the, 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 the Spanish king, emperor, uh, declared war on Britain and, and, and sent a whole fleet of ship, uh, an armada of, of ship to destroy this island, to bring it back it under its control. That time, the, the king called uh, uh, the whole nation to pray and fasting. And that prayer and fasting was phenomenal because within a few hours, God sent a, a, a gale, a hurricane, hit the Spanish ship. The majority of them were destroyed and just a few of them survived and went back. Everybody could see the supernatural intervention of God 
in the life of the nation of Britain it wouldn't be here today. Another incident was in Holland when the Spanish again were fighting the Dutch people who, were, who had fought for 75 years to be free. They believed they should be a nation. They didn't want to be a, a colony of the Spanish. And these Dutch people had believed they had the, uh, turned to God in repentance. And now they were under this. So in a place called Leiden, and they, they called upon the God, God and prayed and fasted and declared the dog prayer and fast. There was a divine intervention. So th these days of, of prayer and the fasting, uh, national days of prayer and fasting are very important days. We believers should always take them seriously and should do. You see, what makes us believers and God's prophets is that we understand God's mind. So if we don't, we, we are just like any other person. We, don't, we can't give guidance, nor can we be God's prophets in a nation. We have to understand his ways. We have to understand what he values, value what he values, and, and so that we can give guidance to our political and civic leaders. And that is a very, very important part in our responsibility. So I wanted to encourage all of you here on this uh, altar this morning to see that significance, to appreciate it, but also to be in that mood today. Maybe not everybody will take it that serious, but the fact that it has come from the head of state God already honors it. Even during Shalmaneser fourth, the fourth is the declaration when he said everybody should not eat, everybody should do uh, fast. Maybe some people did it. I don't think every single home did it, but in general, God saw this as a national day of humiliation and repentance and therefore honored the king. He honored the king. Uh, and, and what he had done, and he himself as a person, and, and said, I'll have mercy on that land. This is very clear. This is the fourth time we're having this since uh, March 2020. That is our uh, last year, when the, we first suggested to His Excellency the President, at that time when he called us to tell us, I'm going to do, lock down the nation. Uh, it was a Tuesday. He said yesterday during cabinet, cabinet had sat on Monday, called us on Tuesday that we agreed to shut down the country because of COVID. But I have called you as religious leaders to let you know that this is going to happen. I didn't want you to just hear it. So we suggested that your excellency, it would be very good as a nation that you declare a day of prayer so that we can pray and seek God's intervention in our land. He immediately said, yes, that is very right. This week, so it was a Tuesday and on Saturday, we had that first prayer. Then in April, we had the second one and then the third. Now, this is the fourth time that the president is calling a national day of prayer uh, and humbling ourselves before him so that he may intervene in the, in our, in the affairs of this. And I want you to notice, I want all of you to take notice of today that you're going to see that God hears prayer. You see that after this day, after we have prayed, you see that in the, we saw it the first time in March. There was a special protection that was upon Uganda. While other nations suffered heavily, we, we didn't suffer as other nations did. Because at that time, our president, our nation openly declared that our trust is in the Lord. And as much as we try to do what we can do, medically. Uh, we also that time applied the blood uh, as the Israelites did in the time of Egypt, applied the blood on the dull intels of, 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 of the state house and all cabinet and, and, and the parliament and the judiciary. And we have seen the hand of God. So I want us to be in that mood, therefore. I want us to all join, spend as much time as we can today in that prayer, because if my people who are called by my name. So God is uh, focus really is on the people who are called by his name. If they do four things, I'll do three. If they humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, turn away from their wicked ways, then I'll do three. Hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Okay, now that is, I interjected and brought in that issue because of it. See, 
centrality in what we are dealing with at the moment. But let me continue with the issue of covenant. Yesterday, I ended on the note that we are not slaves, but friends. That God's covenant, let, let me recap on a few, few points which are very critical. That to the Hebrew, the word righteousness is a relationship term. It means maintaining the covenant. And we saw that Abraham's covenant was based on a relationship, a friendship with God. I want to build on that today, that God wants a relationship. God is after a friendship with the people. I know he's very, very interested in us living a righteous life. But for him, that righteous life can only come as a result of a relationship. I don't know how much I can emphasize this. He knows that we can't do it by our own effort. We cannot, by our own effort, please God in any way. It doesn't matter how much we try. Therefore, he desires instead to maintain and have a very, very close and intimate relationship with us so that he infuses his power, he infuses his life. It is his life that has to be lived out in our lives. It is his life, only the life of his son that pleases him. No amount of struggle, no amount of effort on your side, human side, can ever, ever even dare reach the uh, uh, height or the standard which God desires. So that's why he emphasizes covenant, because in covenant, there is an exchange of life. In covenant, there is an exchange of life. Let me repeat that. In covenant, there is an exchange of life. He gives you his life, and you leave it. In marriage, you exchange life. That's how God arranged it. That's why there is, on the first night, there is the shedding of blood. When the, uh, the man or woman, if both are virgins, the blood will be shed for the first time. But that act of sexual union means a mixture of life. He's, your life and my life come together, and that's the product. The product are the children, because you start to live through each other. That is what covenant really means. Covenant is a covenant of love, and that's what he had wanted with Israel. Unfortunately, Israel didn't accept it, as I'm going to show you shortly. Uh, God had wanted a covenant relationship. It wasn't laws and rule regulations. It was a, a relationship. The same with David. Why did he choose David? Intimacy. He wanted a man after his own heart. In the New Testament, individually, corporately, we are restored in relationship. Everything we lost in Adam in the New Testament, it is restored. We are friends. We are not slaves. We are not servants. Angels are slaves. So they are servants of God, but we are sons. There is a big, big, big difference. What is the difference? Servants and slaves don't have the life of God in them. Human beings, sons, have the life of God in them. We are sons. We are not servants. We are children. We are friends. That's the difference. Now, uh, and I'm going to say a little bit more on that. So a covenant, uh, I want to, to also bring out this, that the, when a covenant is made, it's not an agreement between parties of equal standing and power, but between unequals. The initiative being taken by the stronger party, who normally in a covenant is called the suzerain, who voluntarily binds himself to take on an obligation to the weaker party, who is the vessel. Now, God is the supreme, is the stronger party. We human beings are the weaker party. And so God voluntarily binds himself and he takes on obligations to fulfill on our behalf when we have nothing to offer. That is brought out so well in the covenant God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. God says, I'm your shield, meaning your protection. I am your reward, meaning provision. In those days when tribe A wanted to enter into covenant with tribe B, this is what they did. Both tribes would come on an agreed day in a field, in a, field a very, very spacious place. One tribe would sit on one side, another tribe would sit on the other side. They would choose representatives from both sides and say, today we want to enter into covenant. Tribe A is very strong in the army, but they don't have enough food. Tribe B is not weak, it's not strong uh, militarily, 
but they have a lot of food. So because they need each other, tribe A, those strong in the army or in their military, they need the provision of food. While tribe B, which has a lot of food, is weak militarily. So they need tribe A, which has a lot, a strong army, so that they can be protected whenever they are being attacked. So it meant that if tribe A and B entered into covenant, every time tribe B is attacked, they would have the tribe A coming on their support and protect them. On the other hand, whenever tribe A suffers famine and lack, tribe B would be there to provide the food. So in the covenants of those days, there was, would be a mutual benefit. Each tribe would benefit in the covenant in that their particular need in the area where they are weak, they would get sustenance and support from the other party. Now in the covenant, the two people who would come forward to represent the two tribes would stand side by side. They would slaughter an animal and put it in the middle. They would slaughter the animal right from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. They would cut it into two and separate the pieces facing uh, side by side. And then the two representatives would cut at the wrist, just below the palm. They would cut and the blood would start to flow on both sides, these two representatives, tribe A and tribe B. Then they would take a, bean, a, a coffee, a coffee, something like a, a bean seed or coffee, uh, 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 being the, 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 in, in Uganda, we, we would use coffee and many other tribes, I'm, I'm sure, would use that, we call it omukago. They would do, uh, uh, put that seed into the blood, in, uh, 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 into the blood, blood pl the, the representative of A would take that seed, immense um, uh, 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 it in the, in the blood, and then give it to the other one. And the other one of tribe B will do the same so that the, what they are doing in exchange is that their blood is now being mixed. From today, we are entering into covenant and our blood is mixed. And both of them would walk through the pieces, holding on to the hand that is bleeding, saying, if I break this covenant, I'll be like these pieces. That's what it would mean. They would walk through this piece is making the figure eight. That's where we get the figure of infinity in mathematics. We use eight uh, to represent infinity because covenant is not broken. You walk through the pieces declaring that if we tribe B or tribe A break this covenant will be like these pieces. So that's how they would make a covenant. And then they will end uh, with exchanging shields. Tribe A would take a shield and hand it over to the representative of tribe B. When they do that, tribe B people would clap so much and shout because tribe A has played that this, we are now your shield. That would be very important. Then tribe A would also exchange the shield. But when B is giving their shield to A, it's not a big deal because they're not strong anyway. But when it comes to the next item we, of exchange, the next item of exchange is now food. They would take a, a piece of uh, uh, millet or something, the food representing something or to do with food. They would, the B would hand to A and say from today, our food is your food. Whatever we have is yours. That's where the tribe A would also shout very much because now B has pledged that whenever you have a problem with food, our food is available to you. Uh, then they would also, of course, A would also do the same. That exchange was very, very important because it symbolized that from today we have come one, we become one person. Uh, and, and, and then the, today one tribe is called A, another tribe is called B. But from that moment, they exchange the name, they become A, B. B is A, B, and B and A is A, B. So, so just like uh, in marriage, you take on the name of your husband when you get married. That is the suzerain normally takes on the name of the other, that covenant. Covenant involves the name and then it ends with the covenant meal. The covenant meal seals 
the covenant. It's joy, rejoicing, praising, and so on. Now, when you look at that picture, then Genesis chapter 15 makes sense. God comes to Abraham and says, I want to promise you. I want to make a covenant with you. First, I'm your shield. I'm your exceeding reward, meaning you have nothing to give me. I am giving you the shield. I'm also giving you the food protection and provision. Abraham has nothing to give to God. So when the night he came to him to make that covenant in Genesis 15, Abraham was sleeping. He saw God in a, in a, in a vision while he was sleeping, God walking through the pieces. God told Abraham, bring animals, cut them into two face, facing each other. And then he went to sleep. So God walked through the pieces like a moving torch God himself declaring that if I break this covenant, I'll be like this piece is, that is the figure eight I've just told you between A and B. That was God coming to Abraham in a language you could understand, the language of his day, of how covenants were made. God holding his hand up and declaring that if I break this covenant, I'll be like these animals. The, the Bible says Abraham saw a a moving torch, it's like a fire moving through the pieces. That was God himself coming down, speaking to Abraham in the language you would understand, indicating that I'm making and sealing this covenant, it is once forever, and that you have nothing to offer me. I'm the one who's going to bring the protection, I'm the one who's going to bring the provision. It is a one-sided covenant. The suzerain, the stronger party, voluntarily binding himself, and taking one obligation to the weaker party that is the vessel. That was God. That is God's covenant. That is the covenant God made. The same in Christ. There is nothing we offered. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for the sins of the world and for the life of the world. Do it as often as you remember, in, the, in remembrance of me. So God offers a covenant to man when man has nothing really to offer. It's a one-sided covenant. And that brings us to another very, very important word, which is the word grace. When you have nothing to offer, when you have nothing to offer God in covenant, it means that he's offering everything. He's giving us freely. There's no benefit on his side. It is purely because of his grace. It is first of all his initiative, but also that we have nothing to give him. He's giving everything. Because the covenant is God's initiative and God's gift to man, it is founded in grace. It is maintained by grace. It operates solely on the basis of grace. Many people don't fully appreciate this. We have nothing to offer God. He's the one who offers protection. He's the one who offers provision. And so because it is God's initiative, it's founded on grace, maintained by grace, operates solely on the basis of grace. Covenant, therefore, is completely undeserved and unmerited. We don't deserve it. We don't merit it. It is an expression of generosity of God and his forgiving love. It does not come from any need on God's part to have a relationship or fellowship with man, it is a free, sovereign expression of the graciousness of his character. Very important that we understand that word grace, because it brings out the major component, the major characteristic of covenant. Grace is a very, very important word. Let me cover a few uh, things about that for us to fully appreciate grace versus what we can do or our efforts that we can really do uh, 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 to impress God because we have none, we have nothing. I want you to notice that it is basically an issue of intimacy with God because he decided to adopt us as sons. Therefore, we are his friends and we are not his slaves. Now, let me start with that understanding of the word adoption because some of us don't understand how it is used, especially in covenant, how we're adopted. Why is it that we have to be adopted as his sons, as his people uh, in covenant? Now, the laws of adoption require 
the death of parents. Some of you who are who know the law, like our sister Kutesha, who has just been praying, and others who are lawyers, you know that the laws of adoption require two things: one, the death of parents, or if the parents are not dead, you have to denounce your previous parenthood or family before you can be adopted. If you are to be adopted, then there has to be proof that the, this uh, 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 child who is being adopted has no parents, either they died or whatever happened, or denounce from that moment that now I denounce my former parenthood because you can't have two. You have to either decide to remain with the former or take on the new parenthood. Now, Adam, where we come from, all of us come from Adam. He claims us until we die. That's why death becomes important in baptism. Because in baptism, we die to Adam's parenthood before we can be adopted as sons of God. We have to denounce our Adamic position. We have to, to denounce the fact that we, our parents were uh, Adam. So we have to die. We have to die to the Adamic race or parenthood before we can be adopted. That's why baptism is very critical in the New Testament. It's the sign of the covenant. People don't understand why baptism is that important. It is because in, 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 in baptism, you die. Okay? In, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says, when, when you believe, you died with him. In Christ, you died and you were buried in baptism before you can now resurrect in another new nation and be born again. How do we become citizens of a nation? We are born into that nation. How did we become Ugandans when we were born in Uganda? So, so suppose you were a Kenyan, you would die in Kenya, they bury you, they forget you. Kumbe, you have come this side and you are now born. You have become a citizen of Uganda by birth. So that is what happens in baptism. Now, look at Israel. Israel had been called into covenant with God, but refused to go before God to be made sons. You see, find that in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and uh, 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 chapter uh, 5, verse 5 and 23 to 28. I can't go into this because of time today. But they, they refused. They refused to, to, to come uh, to God to become sons. Instead, they settled for the law. They, God, God had wanted them to be intimate, to become sons. Instead, they chose the law. We are made sons by being before God. Now, this is a fact that most people, especially many Christians, don't realize. Let me read this 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Listen to what it says. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Lord, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Now, what is it that is hidden in here? What the scripture explains that the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You are released from bondage by being before him. And so when you start to see the glory of the Lord and you come into his presence, you are changed into a son. You become sons by revelation of him. We become more and more and more like him by beholding his face, unveiled face means revelation. He, he starts to give us revelation so that we become like him. Our adoption into sonship is not by we trying to actively do things to just please him. No, it's a revelation he gives us of him that as we see him with unveiled face, we are changed. 
we are transformed. We become like him. This is what he had wanted Israel to do. That with unveiled faces, when we see his glory, we are transformed into his son. Remember he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So that likeness to be like him comes through seeing him with unveiled face. What does unveiled face mean? Revelation. He gives us revelation of him. This is what he had wanted Israel to be. He wanted to bring Israel to himself. He told them, I brought you out of Egypt to myself so that you may come to me and become sons. They didn't want that. They told Moses, ah, we cannot bear that guy is shouting so much. You go in, let him tell you what he wants. Whatever God says, we will do. We will do. We, we, we don't want to go before him. The, the way he shouts, he's so loud. He's so, look at the earthquake, look at the, ah, we can't manage that. So they settled for the law instead of being intimate. I want you to notice those two. Instead of intimacy, they chose the law. Instead of going before him to become sons, they chose the law. The law is easier because you tick this one, I've done this one, I've done this. Intimacy means you spend more time in his presence. You spend more time in knowing him, in seeking to understand him. Just like before you got married, you wanted to know your, uh, 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 you know, the guy who was engaging you or the woman that you wanted to marry, you wanted to spend more time to understand what are his interests, what does she want, what does she enjoy, you know? It took me time to understand my wife uh, when we were, we were dating. I, want, I, I came to understand she enjoys walking uh, around, she enjoys uh, 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 traveling. And, and so in the, uh, the first few years uh, of, of our marriage, I always made sure that every last weekend of the month, I would take her out uh, because I came to know that she was denied a lot of this when she was young, she didn't travel enough she was a, 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 a kind of a, 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 um, limited she was so limited in her, in their traveling and working and what so you always want to uh, uh, the person you love you want to please them you want to bring to do something that pleases them because it increases that intimacy that intimacy comes from understanding the person. Uh, that's the purpose of dating, spending more time of sharing and talking. Where are your interests? What are your interests? What do you want? What do you enjoy? This is what God had wanted for Israel. We also, in our time, prefer activities to satisfy our religious longings instead of intimacy with our father so that we may grow into mature sons. I want you to make note of this statement that I'm making. In our days, many people spend so much time in activities, running around. Some of these are religious. They, are, they sound very, very good, but they are actually activities that instead take us more as, as, uh, away from God than even bringing us closer to him. Because we majority of us don't understand the importance of being intimate with your father. It is this intimacy that makes you to grow into a mature son. Activities give you a sense of self-worth and sense of achievement. That's what we show people. We, we are happy. We, are, we, we feel we are worth. We, 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 we have achieved. Because of activities in college, you know, to college, you know, to, that, that is a, a sense, a human kind of satisfaction and self-worth. It comes from activities, running away from the presence of God like Jonah. Jonah ran away from God's presence to trade with the world in touches. God wants us to spend more time with him in intimacy so that we can grow into sons. Covenant is a covenant of sons to make us sons, not slaves, not servants, but sons. It flows out of intimacy. This is what God longs for. Jesus told the woman at the world, time is coming and now he is. When the true worshipers will not worship in this mountain and they will not worship in 
Jerusalem. It will not be a place or activity. It will be intimacy. They will worship him in spirit and in truth because that's what the father has been longing for. So that issue of intimacy is what Israel forfeited. So the Jews instead chose the law. And uh, so God promised the Jews four things. I will make you a nation. I will protect you. I will protect your economy. And I will give you health care. Of course, I will take away all the sicknesses that I had put on the Egyptian. I will take them away. Those four things, becoming a nation, being protected as a nation, <coughs> providing for them, and then keeping them healthy was the benefit, the four major benefits he gave the nation. And then he gave them the law. It was given to bring order to the Jews as a nation of slaves that have never known order. It also contained issues of jurisprudence, of rules of evidence, property laws, tort laws, criminal laws. They needed to be orderly as a nation. It also contained that are the rules of how they should eat hygiene in order that their health is preserved. So the law served the other four uh, issues for them to be protected as a nation, for them to be to have their economy and to be healthy. They needed those dietary rules for the nation to not to self destruct. They self destruct. They needed rules of evidence and property laws and tort laws and criminal laws so that there is order. That was the purpose of the law. So in exchange, the Jews were required to keep that law and also pay the tithe. However, the Jews inability and unwillingness to keep that law, which already they had committed themselves to, whatever God says we will do. That's what they told Moses. Moses, we don't want to go to God. Just go there, get the laws, come back, tell us whatever God says we'll do. They gave him a signed check. Let him fill in whatever he wants. We will do. I said, sure, you will do, my Lord. Said, okay. So, so 40 days later, they were already worshiping other gods. The very same laws, the Ten Commandments, they had already started to break them. The first one, you shall have no other gods. They say, Aaron, let's get another god. Moses, we can't see Moses. This is one month and 10 days. You can't see him. Get it another God. Number two, which was the second one? Who remembers the second one? The second one, he said, you shall have no graven image. You shall make no graven image. They made what? A calf, a golden calf. They broke the first one. Then the second one, God said to Moses, go down. They have already broken the first two. They are determined to break all my laws. Go down back into the camp and find out this, what these people are already doing. So, they broke the law only 40 days, less than 40 days later, they had already broken the, 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 the law that they had promised God that whatever he says we'll do. Now, the Jews' inability and unwillingness to keep the law brought a date. Now, I want you to listen to this part. In order to appreciate the covenant, we need to understand the intimacy, the importance of why God wants us to be intimate. How, why he wants us to be sons, why he deliver and how he delivers us from slavery. The law makes you a data. How? The law contains laws of accountability to God. When you get a benefit for which you have an obligation to pay, but you have not paid, you have incurred a debt. Because the law demands something, you have not done it, yet you've got the benefits. God has given them the benefits for which they were supposed to keep the law and they hadn't, and so they are now debtors. The debt, once you become a data, you have to pay a debt. It is one of the four ways in which you pay the debt. Somebody else can pay your debt for you. When it comes to the law, Jesus had not yet come, and so there was no payment on the tide of the human beings. Once a person, a soul that sinner, she shall die. Jesus hadn't died, and so everybody becomes the data. Number two, you could be forgiven, but because there was no provision for forgiveness under the law, nobody could be free. There is no provision in the law. The law demands eye for eye, tooth for tooth, 
So you, you, once you choose the law, that's what it is. Number three, your asset could be taken and used to, be, to satisfy your debt. Now, there's no asset that can match your spiritual debt. You can pay for a house, uh, but for when it comes to a soul, what is it that you can pay for your life? There is no, there is no, man, no amount of money. Then number four, you are the only asset left. You change from being a human being to an asset. You are sold, and that is slavery. Now, that, those four points, I want you to really appreciate them. First and foremost, I said, when you choose to be under the law as Israel did, you must pay the debt only in one of the four different ways. Somebody else pays for you, or you are forgiven, or you pay by your assets, but none of those works for your spiritual debt. And therefore, because none of those can pay for your spiritual debt, you yourself become an asset. You change from being human to an asset. You are sold. You become a slave. You remember in Second Kings how this woman came to the prophet of God and said, oh, your, my husband was a godly man, but he left a lot of debts. The creditor has now come, demands his payment. We have nothing to pay. So the children are now going to be taken to become slaves. That's what it is under the law. And the, the prophet says, you fill the jars and go pour uh, water into them and you find oil and sell and pay the debt. You remember that's, that happened, was it Elijah or Elisha, one of the two. And, and so in, in a sense, when you are under the law, you automatically become a slave. And that's how the laws became uh, 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 enslaved Israel. Israel was a slave because of the law. Why? The problem is not the law. The problem is that we have the flesh who cannot fulfill the law and makes us a data. Ishmael was not Abraham's heir. Why? Because of Hagar. Hagar is a slave. Every child of Hagar will be a slave perpetually. Because once a slave, you cannot be a son. You can't choose to be a slave and a son at the same time. That's why Hagar could not be. God said to Abraham, Hagar uh, and her son cannot be. Ishmael cannot be your heir because he's born by a slave. That's what Paul explains in Galatians. So a slave has no rights of inheritance against his father, even though there is a biological connection. There's a biological connection between Abraham and Ishmael, but because of Hagar, the slave, the slave, Ishmael cannot be here. So the law would not recognize the claim of the slave against the father. You have no legally enforceable rights as a slave. The law created us, created slaves, because there was an indebtedness which could not be paid. And the children of Israel under the law could not never, never become sons. This is a very important aspect in the Bible, a very important explanation that Paul gives to the Galatians to explain why it was so important for them uh, to understand the new covenant in which they had entered. Therefore, what was the position of the Jews? The law created slaves because there was a debt that could not be paid and the children of the law that is Israel, we are born under the law, were inherently born into slavery. Because the Jews were slaves, they could never be sons. God promised the Jews sonship. The Jews refused sonship. God gave them the law, which made them into slaves. God would hold the Jews under the restriction of the law until the seed should come. But once uh, uh, of the seed came, he fulfilled the law and did away with it. Very interesting. The new covenant now comes in, which you call the covenant of sons, the covenant of grace. That is the importance of the issue of grace. God brings grace. In John chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says, the law came through Moses. 
but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let's read that uh, in conclusion. John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What Jesus gives us is grace and truth. What Moses brought to the Israelites was the law. The law made us slaves. Grace and truth makes us sons. In the new covenant, in this covenant of grace, God wants us to be intimate with him. That's why in covenant, friendship and intimacy are very, very important. What I tried to do today was to show you the difference. The difference between what pleased is what the Jews chose and what God had wanted. In our time, many times we choose activities instead of intimacy. That's why you find even in this time of lockdown, when people would have actually said, no, let me use this time to reconnect with God, to reconnect with my wife, to reconnect with my family, to reconnect with, so, so that we can have more union, more intimacy. But yet of the people don't want, they shout, they quiet, they do all the kind of things that they're doing. The whole country you find people are shouting, apart of course from those who don't have food at home, you could possibly understand. But for Christians, I think for us, we should never look at this as a big problem because it gives us time to be more intimate with God, spend more time with him. That's what we are going to do in these 40 days. We are going to recalibrate our connection, our intimacy, move closer to God. According to 2 Corinthians 3.17, see him with unveiled face, receive revelation, seek closeness with him so that we may become sons and we may be more in his likeness. We'll end there today. Uh, back to uh, Pastor Deo. I uh, will pick on that tomorrow. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop Joshua. Let's clap to the Lord wherever you are. And also thank <coughs> Bishop Ureri for sharing powerfully. May the Lord bless you so much, Bishop, in Jesus' name. So we want to bless the Lord for all that he has done. Thank you for all of you who have joined us this morning. Thank you for all of you who have led us through the prayers, Bishop Odongo, our sister Mary Kamaliktesa, our sister Alan Kajina. Thank you for leading us. And we want to appreciate all of you who have been joining every morning. Thank you. We are represented by different leaders from different institutions. We have many, many institutions represented the parliament, some people were there from the parliament executive, we have those from the state house, ministers of the gospel pastors, we have prayer leaders from NAFBAC, from UCSI, we have people from DLS, Global Leadership Summit, government ministers like Dr. Jen Luther Chen, thank you. Yesterday you led us well, and Dr. Diana, and the Minister of Health, we have you on with us throughout this week, thank you so much. We have of the judiciary, some judges praying with us here today, and those of you from the judiciary, may the Lord bless you. We have some people from UNRWA, URA, Development Authority, I mean, Dairy Corporation, Dairy Authority, and Public Service Commission, have people from NIRA, from UTB, from different universities, Makerere and UCU and others. Many people, thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless you. Please invite as many as possible to join this revival, to join these teachings. Maybe some of you would like the notes. We shall give you maybe a contact, a number where I know Bishop is ready to share notes with you. We shall, tomorrow we shall tell you how we are going to be sharing notes with you, maybe by you giving us your contact. We shall see how to give you those notes, share those notes with you, and the Lord shall bless you. Please this spend this day of prayer, national day of prayer, in fasting, if possible, humbling yourself before the Lord, meditating, spend some time, quality time before the Lord as you work or as you, as you do whatever you're doing, but let's value this national day of prayer and the Lord shall bless us. And also want to bless you for joining us. 
And also, I want to encourage you, please, to give an offering. Support God's work by giving an offering. We have that number in the names of Dr. Michael Mohumuza. Yeah, you can give. He's our administrator for the altars. You can give and support God's work, and the Lord shall bless you. Yes, the Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Thank you, our sister Betty Bianima, for all the work you are doing. And all those who have joined us, please, may the Lord bless you. We meet tomorrow at 5, up to 7, and we shall continue having a great time before the Lord. Have a blessed National Day of Prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've been Pastor Delms. Okay. Amen. When you pray to know how to pray Just remember the Lord will hear and the answer is on its way Our God is able He is mighty He is faithful And He never sleeps He never slumbers He never tires Stronger.